Japan. I'm a, a long-term settler, resident of Fulford Harbor, Kwananich. Hope Eric might be able to improve my pronunciation of this uh, of, of this place. So this first slide um, was taken by my great grandmother who was an um, artist and uh, a settler of, of what she called Salt Spring Island and overlooking what she called Fulford Harbor. And so I grew up with stories from my great great granny and my great granny and my granny and my 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 own family about this extraordinary um, bounty of Fulford Harbor, and uh, right next door um, were, was the Seattle Reserve, and living next door was um, my great granny used to call him Charlie, but. This is his uh, Sinchothan and I believe Halkaminum wife. You might know, Eric would be able to correct me. So my, my understanding of the of Fulford Harbor was really informed by um, my own ancestors, experiences of it, and the stories of, from their neighbors. Um, I believe Charlie was a fisherman and the harbor was always full of life. Uh, my mom used to talk about herring spawns coming in, the the blackfish that would follow the chinook in, and the um, and the stories related to from there just exchanged as as people occupied this land. I mean, it it is it's a very rich harbor. And here's three generations of my family. Um, oh, they were in the boats all the time. They were fishing, they were clamming, they were sharing, you know, cultivating apples, but largely um, living well uh, with, with this tremendous bounty. And it's only, you know, through my relationships over time with people like Celelia, uh, Belinda Claxton, and, and Eric Pelkey that I've really come to understand actually what happened over the last hundred years and through colonization. And so the, the role of herring and my role of as a settler and the colonial exploitation of herring has become really a of a, a thing of of you know interest to me and also out of respect to elders like Celia and and Eric. So Celia also suffers from one of these the the this this lack of seafood in her diet and has struggled with it. And um, so I've really felt that we all have a huge obligation to examine what we've been doing to this extraordinary resource. And my own understanding of, of the kind of bounty that used to be from my own family, I know that when I hear Department of Fisheries and Oceans telling me that, oh, herring are at historic levels um it it's it's an it's such an insult it's an insult to anybody that that knew this coast before the the really the onslaught of some of these um huge industrial fisheries that were unleashed on this coast what they used to call the herring bonanza so um this is this is a a wheel that I worked on with Celilia and many of the elders, later Earl Claxton. And this is referring again to Eric referred to, he talks about Wacus, these are the 13 moons. And you see on the Wacus sort of where the Douglas fir and the, there's a, 
I can see WXES, Wacus, Moon of the Frog. Um, this was a collaboration um, that was um, asked for by Celilia because she felt that this would help to aid the understanding if we work together, to work together. And, and it was in the doing of this and listening to elders and understanding this incredible interconnectedness of everything, not just, not just the herring and the salmon and the orcas, uh, but everything, all the plants. The, and so these kinds of, of um, stories have really informed um, my understanding, certainly, of the herring and the, 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 the incredible um, problems with the way DFO has characterized the fishery. So I just want to take people back to 1859, which is around the time that my family um, arrived here, and many of my family were um, part of these uh, corporations that were just intent on exploitation. So I'm just going to read this in case people can't read it. Herring fishery. Why, why it is someone is not already engaged in putting up herring in and around Victoria for home use and exportation, we know not. Of one thing we are certain, that the herring fishery would this season find profitable employment for hundreds of our population. Our shores are swarming with them. And as I look out my window today, I still live on Fulford Harbour, the shores are not swarming with them. The shores should have been swarming with them, but they are not swarming with them anymore. So this is 1905. By 1905, the corporations are starting to form the Nanaimo Herring Canning. This was just one of the advertisements um, about the way that these companies formed and allocated shares and set a pattern that was to continue um, and continues to this day. Um, here you're seeing this, this um, borrowed tradition coming out of the Scottish herring uh, industry, which they used to call them silver darlings, which, they, which completely collapsed. And so a lot of my relatives were Scottish. They had exhausted the Scottish herring populations and now we're arriving on the, on the Pacific and we're set to exploit them as well. Um, this is from The Colonist, again in 1906. Um, it says, By combination of circumstances now existing in British Columbia, our proposition shows money-making possibilities that are astounding. First, because it's by far the most profitable indigenous industry to British Columbia. Second, because it is the first and only herring cannery along the Pacific coast. And third, because the business is a permanent one and the product is consumed by every man, woman, and child in the country and will, in addition, be exported largely to the Orient and elsewhere. And fourth, because the herring can be purchased by the company in unlimited quantities at prices ranging from $3.50 to $8 per ton. Again, in the 1906 Colonist, um, there's an editorial, and it says, The best thing for gover governments to do in relation to the herring fisheries is to let them alone, except insofar as the police of the sea is concerned. With this proviso, let the people fish how they like, as they like, and when they like. At present, I must repeat the conviction we expressed so many years ago that there is not a particle of evidence that anything man does has an appreciable influence on the stock of herring. It will be time to meddle when any satisfactory evidence that mischief is being done is produced. And I'd like to suggest that a hundred years later there is sufficient and satisfactory evidence that mischief has been done. So I want to just show you this clip. This was produced in 1953, I believe. And I want people to listen really carefully to when they are fishing, the size of the herring, and to the structure of the industry at the time. It's produced by the National Film Board. In the waters along Canada's Pacific coast, in the Gulf of Georgia, in the channels between Vancouver Island and the mainland, the fleets of the fishing companies compete for a share of the catch. It's early autumn and time for herring. This is big business, expensive business. A saner may cost $120,000. A herring net alone will cost $28,000. There's big money too for the fishermen. 
But to make it, they've got to get their catch before the quotas fished up and the area closed. If a company's fleet is lagging behind, it means big worries. Well, I'm plenty worried. The fleet's off to a bad start, and it'll soon be too late to catch up. I'll call you back. Not much change. Bye. Crusader got another 300. Have you heard how the other companies are doing? Jimmy says they're picking it up pretty fast. Well, our boys had better get cracking. They'll be closing that area any day now. that I did around um, 1994, the, the herring in Fulford Harbor um, had disappeared by around 1983. We just suddenly stopped. They just were nowhere. And I went around and I interviewed some of the old timers and produced this map to try and capture what Fulford Harbor um, was like at the time from, from some of the um, settler uh, old timers. And of course, the same, this, this sort of, this story started to, I started to hear the same story over and over and over again about the fact that the herring had been there up until, so it, it would sort of have resurged after some of the, the big commercial fisheries earlier. And then suddenly in the 80s, um, the fish, the uh, population just disappeared again. So um, we put together, this was a, a collaborative effort of Vanessa McMartin, of Alex Harris, a young filmmaker, and, and myself. And we, we looked at DFO data, and then that was dating back to the 50s, and then charted when there was no more spawn after a period like there'll be three years of no consecutive spawn so each one of those you can see were spawns herring spawns these are the sort of bay pop populations as it were and i'm just gonna just watch those blue oops that's sorry um not sure how to okay there it goes you can just start seeing the blue dots will just start disappearing and this is dfo's own data and what these coincide with, and we've, we've got the evidence, and, and people like Dana Lepofsky and her lab have got the evidence of people uh, stating that the saners would come into their bays and then clean them out. Um, so there it is again. So um, let's, just, let's just look at what happened in, in Fulford Harbor itself. This was... Swanson Channel is um, the regional name, but this is Salt Spring Island. And the Ganges um, population is, is at the top with all those colors and the Fulford, Fulford spawning population is below. And these were spawns that 
traditionally occurred. And so what you were watching was in the in the animation before was the disappearance of essentially these spawns. So um, even though they might occur slightly different places along the shoreline and different eelgrass areas and you know herring are ultimately very very adaptable and and very good at at ducking and weaving predators but um saners are they have not figured out how to duck those saners that we saw in that clip so here's um here's dfo's data for um swanson channel and you can see that's exactly the year 83 i remember looking at this and going yep that's exactly right uh, 1983 is when, so you saw 1950, they they were just recovering from being really hit back by those fisheries that you saw in the in the movie, and they started to rebound just like Eric says. They these families come back, they're amazingly resilient, and they were starting to they got hit back again. You can see the big fisheries. Um, the catch is blue, and the red is the estimated spawners. Um, they're doing they're doing very well. They've they're they're building up their stocks again. And then 1983, and then you get these few little stragglers trying to 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 do their best. And now we haven't had spawn in our in full for for years um, that has really even been visible. So um, this is another. Um, uh, account by Walter Paul of Klamin, and this was another important bay population. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans decided that uh, uh, they were going to open up a terminal fishery, a commercial fishery here in front of the village, and in Melispina Strait from Grief Point all the way up to uh, Dinner Rock. So it was all saners basically that came in and uh, they would blow the horn and away they'd go and uh, and go on with the bonanza and collect all the uh, their hanging they could, right? So they they did that three years in a row, and it was after that, probably not the next year, but you know the year after, two years later, that you could see a decline happening with the uh, return of the herring. So the questions were posed, you know, at that point, uh, that to Department of Fisheries and Oceans, you know, we wanted an answer as to why, you know, they thought that the uh, herring was in decline. And, um, you know, they kind of put us aside and pushed us back and, you know, and uh, didn't really have an answer for us right away. So, you know, we took it for granted that it was the uh, same fishery that, you know, decimated the, the stock, you know. And uh, so eventually they came back to us with their answer is that, you know, the herring that did come here into Malaspina Street in front of the village, Scuttle Bay, was not a... Um, was basically a transient herring that came here and milled around here and before they're as they're ready to spawn they would leave and head for Vancouver Island, Denman Island, Hornby Island, that area to spawn there and uh, I thought that was a weak you know a weak excuse you know uh, to us for that as we we understood and we seen it firsthand the spawn that happened here you know they would spawn here and they would stay here So um, there was a real sea change within DFO itself. Um, in 1986, sort of around that those years, uh, one of their, or two of their scientists, Jake Schweigert, um, produced a document that was really looking at, with, it did a whole questionnaire with, with fishers and First Nations fishers um, about where, where were these non-migratory stocks? And that was the language that was used by DFO. That's certainly the language that we all use. We used to call them resident herrings. They were the herring that kind of moved for, for my family. They would move out into um, Sansom Narrows, and that's where you'd see all the ducks. You'd see the grebes. You'd just see everything out there. There'd be like a winter population of birds, and they would um, hang out there with these resident stocks. Um, so in 86, those, the, this questionnaire was done and a, um, a report was done. And Marion Lightly, this article here on homesteader herring, 
did a article for one of the fishing magazines and it was kind of like raising the question that it wasn't it was a problem that all these local bay populations or resident populations non-migratory there was a lot of different language lots of different fishermen different terms but it was really well understood that we had herring all year and they would go to certain areas and that um, they would then come back into other specific areas to spawn and sometimes they would um, I remember um, Eric uh, his, his cousin or his relative Dave um, Elliot and the uh, talks about the scouts leading them in you know into their bays to come and spawn so there was a lot of understanding not fully but that the fact that DFO really needed to get their 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 heads around this fishery because it was really pushing down these these resident st stocks and they were um, and that was impacting them so here's here is Jake Schweigert's uh, uh, document the George and Johnson Straits herring bait fishery in 1986 results of a questionnaire survey and it points to these really important what we would have called winter bait fishery locations Sansom Narrows, Cowichan Bay, Swanson Channel, Bedwell Harbor that's where people went to get and you would ask any fisherman and they'd say yeah that's where I go to get my bait um, and so for people for the DFO to start saying that suddenly that no, there's no such thing as resident or overwintering or it, it would just it it was a nonsense. Um, it didn't make any sense. And here's another page in the in the DFO book, um, which clearly identifies non migratory spawning locations and migratory spawning locations. And in this document, there's over 230 non migratory locations described by local fishermen. So you can see right there, Fulford Harbor was a non-migratory spawning location. So um, fast forward from 1990 on there seems to have been complete amnesia in the fisheries and oceans uh, department about ever having produced these documents that there ever was identified a problem by any of the nations. It doesn't matter which local nation you walk into they'll have the same story um, you can go and find elders who'll say oh yeah 1984 the saners came in at night they fished all night and we never had a herring spawn again um, so at that stage by by the late 90s we were I believe the first um, protest that we did was in 95 and it was in Shimanus, and it was citizens from the islands who were missing their herring, and it was First Nations, Shimanus people, um, saying, stop fishing our herring. And I remember walking around with my sign saying, save the herring. And um, people kind of looked at us incredulously. I had a herring and a Chinook and an Orca on my sign. And it, you know, the level of understanding of of say the settler population was very low, so it was a it was a long um, process of of trying to educate um, the local communities, and um, and and that continued over the next uh, ninety five two thousand and five <laughs> twenty five years twenty five years um, different members of local communities have been writing letters. Um, trying to argue that the fisheries needs to be better understood. It's not okay to treat it as one big meta population, one big migratory population that just swims in and goes to one place and that's what you manage. And it's not okay to say that the historic levels were based in 1951. If you remember that diagram I showed you in 1951 they were at historic lows so that's not a historic baseline I prefer to go to the historic baseline of the time of the uh, British colonist newspaper in Victoria that said our shores were swarming with herring um, so the the real issue I feel has been that we have been dealing with a corporate 
fishery and a government that is in closely aligned with a corporate fishery. And as in all things, fisheries have really worked on the on the the uh, the principle of economies of scale and amalgamation. And we have had a f the 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 Harry the herring, which was a a logo that was developed for school kids, um, has had a formidable ally, and it it's in the form of Jimmy Patterson Enterprises. Um, this is a man that has the second largest privately held company. He has companies in fisheries, coal ports, logging, food, all things that actually herring um, are, uh, you know, could actually be um, a threat to. Um, because when you start looking at the impacts of logging on estuaries and their and their and their their, their breeding habitat, and you start looking at the impacts of port development on the Fraser River, and you look at the impacts of uh, the commercial fisheries, the kill fisheries, um, you realize that this is not a company and this is not a man that is that interested in the stories of elders all throughout the Salish Sea. And I just noted that uh, that he was cited as saying his best year yet was 2020 with annual sales of $10.9 billion. Um, so Rob Morley, he's always, uh, Patterson has always kept ex-DFO people very close to him and political people close to him. And Rob Morley, who was an ex-DFO economist, is his representative presented in Parliament in, in 2016, arguing that he didn't hold a, a monopoly, that he only held one third of the herring seine licenses and 12% of the gillnet licenses. Um, but it really depends on how you track those companies. These are all companies which are somehow affiliated with Jimmy Pattison Enterprise or the Canadian fish company Canfisco. They're either operators when uh, Jimmy's boats are the uh, Jimmy is the owner, or they're operated in some way. They're they're working and liaising. So it it looks when you go and look at the data, it looks um, sizably more than thirty percent of these uh, fisheries are owned by one man. So I just wanted to finish with a couple of last sort of this again I'm going to read it but I think it's worth reading. This was um, an article that was put out by two ex-DFO fishers, fish, uh, fish scientists rather, Carl Waters and Richard Hedrick, um, that were that provided evidence of the suppression of and the political interference with research by industry influenced government officials. And this was published in the Canadian Journal of Fish and Aquatic Science in 1997. It said the present framework for linking science with management can and has led to abuses that threaten the ability of scientists to understand fully the causes of fish declines, to identify means of preventing fishery collapses from recurring, to incorporate scientific advice and management decisions and to communicate research in a timely fashion to as wide an audience as possible. The existing framework of government-sponsored fisheries science needs to be replaced. It has failed to ensure viable fish resources and thereby sustain the fishing people and fishing communities upon which successful fisheries management depends. The economic and societal cost of this failure to Canada has been enormous. So I want to finish with um, the collaboration. Um, the, the, there's over 167,000 people that have signed petitions. There are uh, our MPs. I think Gord John's going to be speaking. There has been the Association of, of BC Municipalities. And so when Wasanich Leadership Council, um, we, 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 worked together, San Anito, you can see on the left the word San Anito, um, which is that the, uh, the, the settler communities um, banded together with the um, First Nations communities to support a First Nations vision of what it could be, which is that we need to we need to have indigenous research, not Western science based on climate models that 
that are sorry that uh, fisheries models that really are inadequate and that we should be going back to family managed herring sites and that we should have a moratorium on this fishery and that we should um, uh, support a herring restoration program and this was the culmination of that conference and forum that we held. Thanks.